Welcome back to The Delineation. I don't remember what episode this is, but today we are talking all about the Saturn-Neptune conjunction. This is something that I have put a lot of thought into. I see a lot of astrologers talking about Pluto and Aquarius and Uranus and Gemini, and I definitely see some talking about Neptune and Aries, but my opinion has been, I feel as if this Saturn-Neptune conjunction that's happening is a much bigger deal than I feel as if I'm seeing other people talk about. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the Saturn-Neptune conjunction and just kind of my thoughts around it. The thing is, I still haven't had my thoughts fully fleshed out on this, to be honest with you guys. And what I wanted to do in this video is I kind of went through the history of the Saturn-Neptune conjunctions and I've formulated my own theories about it. And I pretty much just want to go through the history of all the other Saturn-Neptune conjunctions and just kind of see what was going on. I have my ideas about what I think it is, but I really want to hear your ideas, given what we're going to discuss today. As well, I'm going to go through a lot of years and a lot of dates, and the hard thing with astrology is, like, okay, let's say there was a Saturn-Neptune conjunction in 1704. What key terms am I going to look up, rather than just like, oh, major events in 1704, but what key terms am I going to look up to get a better idea of what the Saturn-Neptune conjunction could have meant? The other part of this is when you do any sort of like history work in terms of astrology, things look so different starting in the 20th century. Like before the 20th century, it's not that everything was the same, but because we're in such a new era of humanity with technology, you know, things do look different as time goes on, but there are things that are consistent. And so this, this episode is essentially going over kind of the past Saturn-Neptune conjunctions and how we can relate that to what current events are going on right now and kind of predicting the future from there. This isn't gonna be my final episode about this, um, but I'm work. this is kind of a series of what I'm just gonna be calling a world at war. As we continue on through the 2020s, we are going to see more and more war, essentially. We're going to see more and more you know, crazy things because that's just how life goes. But I believe that the combination of Uranus and Gemini which will be a big U.S. thing, and I will have an episode about the U.S. divorce slash civil war, whatever that's going to be. We're going to do an episode about that. Um, Neptune ingressing into Aries along with the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in Pluto and Aquarius. You know, my major predictions are essentially World War III, um, and it's not going to be like, you know, again, no one called the, the World War One, you know, World War I. Um, They called it the Great War, and it took a while to get there. Wars have different names, and... There's just a few things that I think will really kind of set the tone for be like to be like, yeah, this is World War III. But um, and I don't say any of this to kind of like scare you guys. Like the more I've gotten into all this stuff, the more I've gotten like a lot more hope. It's just that on one end, things will get worse before they get better. And on another end, it's like when you look at this stuff, it's easy to be like, oh, the worst case scenario is going to happen. And then everything goes to shit and it never gets better again. And that's just not how it works. Like. There is an equilibrium of like, okay, bad thing happens, so then we're going to see a reaction to it. Um, So we'll go ahead and jump into it. I will say on my last delineation episode, a lot of people complained about my microphone and how you heard like this noise. Can you hear that? Um, I tried to work on this. Uh, for all my audio files out there, I'm using a DBX286S. I really, really like it, but I also use it for music recording, and sometimes I go back and forth with settings, and I forget to kind of change some things. So if the audio is really annoying and you hear me do that, uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to try really hard to not do that because I, when, I, when I saw complaints about that and I re-listened, I was like, oh, my God, that's so horrible. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and jump in. So the Saturn-Neptune conjunctions, um, you know, a lot of astrologers talked about the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that we had in 2020. Uh, Saturn-Pluto oppositions and conjunctions are really big deals. And I just don't see the same attitude with the Saturn-Neptune conjunctions. Now, it's not Pluto, but it is still like a really major planet. So the conjunctions are the first one we get is July of 2025, but it's within 15 minutes. So Saturn and Neptune don't actually conjoin each other, but they get about 15 minutes away from each other while I think it's like Neptune is at maybe two degrees and Saturn's at one degree or something like that. They're like like one degree apart, like they're in different degrees, but they're 15 minutes apart. So it gets really, really close. And that's like, like I said, one and two Aries. But the actual conjunction we get is on February 20th, 2026. And that's at zero Aries. 
Now, 2026 is <clears throat> like, I think a lot of the World War stuff will be mostly spring of 2025, like around that, like April, May time. But 2026 is like full steam ahead with all of those things. Um, themes that we're going to talk about. Number one is media. I made a video over last summer about the Apple Vision Pro. None of you watched it, and it was so disappointing because it was one of my favorite videos I've ever done. Parker killed the editing, and it, I really just kind of go into like the smack dab of like Apple Vision Pro is a part of the Saturn Neptune conjunction. Um, that's a really big deal. Like, and I'll be kind of going about that, uh, talking about that as we go on. But Saturn Neptune conjunctions and oppositions have to deal with big media. Um, innovations in technology or big media shifts that, you know, kind of resonate throughout the decade. We're also going to be talking about governments, mostly about politics. And again, because this episode is like, we're going to be talking because the series is really about like world war three stuff. We're going to be talking a little bit about that, <clears throat> but a lot of Saturn Neptune is media. Um, we will go a little bit into the U S uh, war slash divorce. It's, you know, I kind of go back and forth of whether or not it's like, oh, it's just World War III, we won't get into divorce. Or it's like, there is some sort of divorce happening while there's like a world war going on, um, which that to me seems more likely. But again, what's difficult about seeing some of these transits is comprehending them of like, okay, this is happening, this is happening uh, in the astrology and this is happening in the world. And then trying to put the pieces together of like, man, could that really happen? Like, Maybe it's because I'm a Gen Z and, you know, I've lived in America, like life has been generally peaceful for the most part. It, th there's things that I struggle to comprehend myself in terms of like just believability. But nonetheless, I think these are important to talk about. We will talk about World War III and chemicals. There, Neptune rules like potions and like serums. And we see these kind of weird biological chemistry, scientific pivot points with Saturn Neptune conjunctions. Now, what I will say uh, for that is it's not as if it takes a Saturn Neptune conjunction for science to progress in any way. Like there are going to be other markers for things in science. However, um, from what I've seen, there seems to be some sort of common theme here. And especially, you know, what I think changes nowadays is science is so rampant, like science is all over the place. Everyone's doing these scientific studies that you're going to see some some sort of new science breakthrough or technology be introduced pretty much every other day. So there's a part of this where <clears throat> things I feel really confident in saying is like Saturn Neptune has some big media stuff. Um, yes, this will involve like World War stuff and like chemicals are kind of on the lower, t uh, lower tier. And there are going to be things that I feel as if is a reach to go towards, but this is just what my research is. And I don't necessarily say like, I'm not here to be like, this is exactly what's going to happen. And this is exactly what it's going to look like. But what I just did is went through the past and, you know, saw common themes that came up. And so why not talk about them? <clears throat> so let's go ahead and start talking about the last Saturn Neptune conjunction in Capricorn. <clears throat> this happened in 1989. Now, the caveat with this one was that this was a Saturn Neptune conjunction in uh, Capricorn with Uranus. So, we only have a handful of Saturn-Neptune conjunctions that were just Saturn-Neptune. Like 1989 had Uranus with it. Um, 19, let's see, 1953 was Saturn-Neptune. 1917 was Saturn-Neptune. 1888 was like Saturn-Neptune, Pluto, South Node. Like there was a lot going on in 1888. And there's a couple others that involve uh, like Uranus or another bigger transit. So it's we can't just be like, oh, this is what they are. Each one is very special and unique. Well, let's talk about this last one in 1989 just to kind of give ourselves a idea. Ah, I see that my um, font is not working on here. Okay, well, that's frustrating, but um, I have a special font for my brand. Like this is, Vis this is Visby Bold, and this is supposed to be Visby, and it's not. Oh, well, anyway. <clears throat> so let's talk about 1989. A few things that we have going on. Number one is we have the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Now, there's going to be things in this where it's like, oh, this is clearly Saturn Neptune. And there's other things where I'm like, well, I don't really like the more that I look at this, it's like, yeah, we see media, we see chemicals. And there's other things that where I, I see this happen. This was a bigger event. But like, what are we attaching to it? When I look at Tiananmen Square Massacre, which um, if you're not familiar, 
essentially there's a bunch of protesters in China. I forgot what it was about. It was a bunch of college students and they just killed them all. Um, and it's like the most censored thing in China. Like no one's allowed to ask about it or talk about it. But what, and that's why I find this particularly interesting with Saturn Neptune because it's one of the most covered up atrocities. Like you literally cannot like talk about the Tiananmen Square massacre in China and there's a lot of censorship around it. A lot of people don't even know about it. And when we talk about Neptune being about illusion and fantasy and Saturn is like reality, like we're, we're gonna limit the cover up, we're gonna limit the, um, the spread of this by covering up, we're going to obfuscate it. That's what I found interesting about Saturn Neptune uh, with Tiananmen Square Massacre. The next thing that we get <clears throat> is the USSR dissolves and the Berlin Wall comes down. Now, why is this important? I do not know what is up with Russia and Saturn Neptune conjunctions, but that is, it's like every time there's a Saturn Neptune conjunction, something happens with Russia. I don't know. And it's like a big deal. So I don't know what, like maybe like I think of like the Iron Curtain, like this kind of like steel fortress, this kind of like, you know, illusion fantasy. Like, you know, there's a lot of like, um, we don't know what goes on on the Eastern Bloc kind of a thing. But I don't know what Russia has to do with Neptune. I mean, I can understand Saturn, but nonetheless, it's like major pivot points in Russia's history, both in the uh, 20th and 19th century, are on, are on these Saturn-Neptune conjunctions. So I'd be curious if anyone knows what that might be around. <clears throat> but we have the USSR dissolving in the Berlin Wall. Now, what I will also say what's important about talking about 1989 is as we go through this, you will start to see commonalities. Um, we have an invasion of Panama. Um, the, the CIA... Loves fucking around during Saturn-Neptune conjunctions. I will tell you that much, and we have a lot more to talk about with that. Invasion of Panama, I thought that was kind of interesting. Not really too sure what that has to do with the Saturn-Neptune conjunction, but that's kind of like, you know, we're just going to put a little, you know, star next to that and maybe see what happens. Um, LA County bans semi-automatic weapons. Why I think this is important is I have talked about in my Saturn-Neptune or my Saturn and Pisces video is like the last time we had Saturn in Pisces was the federal assault weapons ban. LA County was, this was the first assault weapons ban in the country essentially. This was after like a mass shooting. Um, when we had the NFA, which was the first firearms ban of any kind, this was with Saturn in Aquarius. Then in 1968, Nixon passed um, some sort of firearms control thing. I forgot what it was. Um, and that was Saturn in Aries which I just kind of like the idea of Saturn and Aries as like control over like the, like, um, like arms, right? Like Aries is literally like war and stuff like that. But LA County banned semi-automatic weapons. This is still on my bingo card for both 2024 and beyond. Um, and I thought this was really interesting given that this was the first one. And, you know, we still see the effects of that today in places like California, all the types of, they have so many complicated bans on guns. Now, we also have this geomagnetic storm caused by power grid failure or caused power grid failure. This is not something that you're going to see too common with the Saturn-Neptune conjunctions because, again, before 1989, it was 1953. And that's, again, some of the hard stuff to kind of, like, bring together is there's such these big gaps with Saturn-Neptune conjunctions that it is kind of hard to always see <clears throat> all of these kind of um, connections with the geomagnetic storm, again, I'm not saying like, oh, we're, that's the exact thing that's going to happen. But I would put a star next to that simply because we are talking about Pluto and Aquarius. We are talking about Uranus and Gemini. The idea, I mean, if you're literally just paying attention to anything at all, a lot of people have talked about like the weakness of the power grid. And I mean, like, look what happened in Texas in 2021. The whole state shut down because it got a little bit too cold. Geomagnetic storms, too, in my conspiracy theory... Um, and this isn't even really a conspiracy theory. It's just more of a theory is a good way to put it. On my wide range of spectrum, it's like here's the very minimal I'm definitely into and here's the max I go to. The max I go to is like the poles flipping, you know, all of that stuff. If you haven't watched uh, Suspicious Observer's YouTube channel, <laughs> I would recommend getting into it, but I would also recommend not getting into it because it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, we're all going to die and there's really no point into it. Um, it can be a little bit scary, but there's a lot of science that does talk about the poles eventually flipping. And so we're kind of in this stage right now where that could eventually happen um, here in the very near future. But um, it's not the biggest concern for me as far as Saturn-Neptune goes. In my opinion, 
It's July of 2036. That's when the polls will flip. And that's just the Saturn-Pluto opposition, but we'll talk about that. Uh, B2 Stealth Bomber. Um, I found I found this also really interesting too when it comes to like stealth and not being able to be detected. And I also talked about this with Saturn and Pisces in my Saturn and Pisces video. It was like um, Saturn and Pisces in the 90s was, um, oh gosh, it wasn't the B2. It was some other, you know, spy plane. Same thing in 1964. That was the... Um, the other one, I can't think of it, but with Saturn and, and, and Pisces, we see this kind of like, you know, new aircraft being kind of launched. Now, why I'm even talking about this related to Saturn Neptune is Saturn and Neptune can join in Aries. But again, they can join at zero Aries and they get damn close in Pisces. When we get to summer of 2025, They'll be both in Aries, but they'll go retrograde and they'll both go back into Pisces. Now, there'll be a couple degrees of separation. However, I do think it's interesting that we have Saturn and Neptune really close together in Pisces and then this massive shift into Aries where it's like Saturn and Neptune and Pisces is so like, what's real? What's reality? We don't know. And then Saturn and Neptune go to Aries. It's like, oh shit, this is what's fucking real. Like, it, it, it's the difference of being like, you're on acid, you're on ayahuasca, you're doing whatever, you're partying, everything's cool. And then all of a sudden, like all the lights in the club come on and there's like cops all around you. You're like, oh, this is like fucking reality smacks you in the face. So some things that we get in 1989 with media. And again, I'm gonna go over this kind of list. And as we go throughout, you are going to see the things that repeat. Um, Tiananmen Square Massacre. I would argue that's a big part of the media. Like I said before, it was a big cover up. Um, I don't know why I put Invasion of Panama here. I, must have messed up on my copy and paste game. Seinfeld. I am in a elite Seinfeld group chat where all we do is quote Seinfeld. And it's not like, oh, you know, um, no soup for you. It's like, I mean, we're, if there was a national championship of like Seinfeld, like trivia, we would take home the gold. I'm playing with big boys here. I'm like, and I'm like a triple A division and I'm playing with major leagues. I only say that because Seinfeld made such a big impact in television. And if you're not familiar with this, essentially sitcoms, like the whole idea of just like, it was all scripted versus Seinfeld was essentially about nothing. And Seinfeld was the first TV show that we get that really ushered in this new era of television where it is really about nothing. And it's kind of just flying off the seat of your pants. There's no, you know, storyline or, or things to tell. And I thought Seinfeld was really interesting. We also get that with the Simpsons premiering the Simpsons also completely changed the game when it comes to television. When you talk about, you know, animation and cartoons, I believe Simpsons and Seinfeld being like these two, like legitimately big TV shows that kind of changed the landscape of television. Being a part of a Saturn-Neptune conjunction is a really interesting connection with media. So something else that we get is the Game Boy. Now, um, I, again, I talk about this in my Apple Vision Pro video. Um, it, it's like pretty much, we had a Saturn-Neptune opposition in Leo and Aquarius. That was in 2006. That was the beginning of the iPhone. Then we had a Saturn-Neptune conjunction in 1989. That was the beginning of the Game Boy. And then we had a Saturn-Neptune opposition in 1971. That was the beginning of email. And then we had a Saturn-Neptune conjunction in 1953. That was like um, colored television and all these other things. And we're going to be talking about that. But the Game Boy is really interesting in terms of like handheld gaming. Um, it, and again, that gives me the more Uranus flavor of things of kind of like new innovative tech. Um, and I believe there's actually a movie. Did it just, it's either coming out or it's already been out for a while about this, uh, the invention of the Game Boy. But anyway, Disney Renaissance. So this is the one that caught my eye the most out of 1989 was in the 1980s, Disney was having a, a lull period. Like they weren't making major hits. And that all changed when The Little Mermaid came out. And that's what started the 1990s, like The Lion King and, you know, all, the Toy Story and all these other really big Disney movies that we all know and love. But I was reading more about this and like even investors were afraid about what was going on in Disney. And can they repeat, you know, any successful movies like they did in the past? Can they... Um put out the charming, you know, mystical stories that they used to tell. And why I think that's interesting is that's what's going on with Disney right now. So part of me is kind of like, you know, where people are like, Disney's never going to make a good movie and it's always going to be just like woke bullshit. I don't know about that. 
Like maybe right now, but I wonder how much the tides change, especially with like once we get to about 2026. Cause like right now, I think Bob Iger just got put back on. And, you know, I don't know if you guys have watched the South Park episode where they make fun of uh, Kathleen Kennedy about, you know, the woke crappy movies that they make. I just wonder what's going on with Disney right now that we see in 2026 give them this, you know, renaissance. Cause again, they called this era the Disney Renaissance once The Little Mermaid came out. I'm really, really interested in that. <clears throat> Uh, Lucille Ball dies. If you're like my mom, me and my mom grew up watching Seinfeld and I Love Lucy. Very funny show. And the only reason I bring this up is I Love Lucy comes up again here really soon. So uh, now we get to chemicals. <clears throat> Two things with this. Number one, we learn that apples sprayed with Alar, Alar cause cancer. This is what I thought was really interesting to me because... <sighs> I get, I don't want to say I get frustrated, but we're all in agreement that lead and gasoline was essentially a scam to like make your car better, but it gave us all like, you know, anger issues and there's bad things in the air. And there seems to be this lack of discrepancy with other chemicals that we put into everything. You know, I've talked a lot about like, you know, me going carnivore and, and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And a big selling point for me on that was like when you learn about how like monocropping works with vegetables, it's it, they're all sprayed with poison, even your organic stuff. Like unless it's straight up from your neighbor who has a couple apple trees, it's that may not that's probably not sprayed. But even the organic stuff gets sprayed and there is no like regulation on what the term organic means and, and all that other stuff. But there's so many chemicals that are in our everyday lives that we don't question. And so many people are more open to the idea of like, okay, again, we all agree lead is bad, but, you know, heaven forbid you bring up 5G radiation being, you know, maybe not beneficial when it's surrounding us con constantly. Um, there's more talk about microplastics. There's more talk about, um, there is more talk about, you know, chemicals being put on foods. And part of me just wonders, Okay, like we had this happen in 1989. And, and again, the big difference here is when you start going back in history, I mean, like, again, we weren't spraying shit back in like the 1700s or even the 1800s. But this is kind of our first taste of what Saturn Neptune looks like, like post, you know, you know, what people like to call late stage capitalism is just more so of like, no, this is just fascism. The corporations own the government and they get away with whatever they want. Um, you know, free market capitalism isn't necessarily bad, but when there seems to be no emphasis on the people and the government being able to regulate things and they just get bought out, they can do whatever they want. And so I look at the Saturn-Neptune conjunction and this kind of like apple sprayed with alar caused cancer is I wonder how much people, like there's some sort of, you know, news that breaks that's like, oh, this thing that we thought was all good is actually not all that good. And this also comes up with, um, the, my next thing is RFK Jr. vaccine deregulation, autism and chronic illness spike. Now it took me a while to find this, but if you haven't listened to RFK Jr. on Joe Rogan, I'd really recommend listening to it. And a lot of people are so, they don't, it, it, it's like it, there seems to be things that when you bring up that seem to be so forbidden that you're not even allowed to discuss it or talk about it. Like there's, you know, so many people that are like, oh my God, vaccines would never cause such things. You know, the corporations and big pharma only have our best interests and they would never do anything against us except for literally their whole entire past. It's like saying, you know, the guy that, you know, cheated on you 15 times is different now and would never hurt you. So in the Joe Rogan podcast, it took me a while to find this, but he talks about the Reagan administration deregulating vaccines. And... This happened in 1986, and the uh, the idea of behind deregulating vaccines was the the pharma companies pretty much went to Reagan and was like, hey, making in vaccines is inherently dangerous, and we can't be sued for liability. It's like for every dollar we make, we have twenty dollars of li downstream liability. Please give us uh you know immunity to liability, and Reagan was like, sure, because it's Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so, but what he talks about here and. I tried looking more into this, but again, the issue with this conversation is when you look up anything about this, it's RFK Jr. is anti-vax and he's anti-science and this has been proven over and over again. Yet, you know, right after we get this, you know, vaccine deregulation, you see like, again, what RFK Jr. says is essentially the autism epidemic started 
1989. And that to me was like, whoa. And same thing with chronic illnesses. And if you are someone who doesn't want to believe that, fine. But I think the way to look at it is, and people are like, oh, aut- vaccines don't cause this autism. We've already you know, seen this. And it's just like, we, how many times do we have to learn that science is completely captured by the corporations because the corporations are the one who fund the scientific research. And so there's a bias to have scientific research that benefits the corporations. There's, I mean, there's so much behind this too. Um, it, it's one of those things where if you're just going to go off scientific papers and you can't just even like bring up a correlation, maybe it wasn't the autism or maybe it wasn't the, um, I always think of tism too. I think the term tism is really funny. But maybe it wasn't the vaccines, but why, why is it so correlative to like vaccines being deregulated and these autism spikes happening? I mean, like if I was autistic, I would want to know what the hell caused it. And my first experience of this was, like, I get really offended when I see people online being like, oh, I have autism. I'm on the spectrum. It's like, well, I'm like 10% Native American. Can I claim that? And the reason I get offended is I have a, a, my first experience with autism was I had this um, my one of my best friends when I was growing up when I was like 16. He had this girlfriend and he lived with her family, her family, uh, her mom, who was like she was like my mom. That wasn't my mom has a son who is severely autistic. Like, I mean, nonverbal again, like. Uh, stimming, the tiptoes, yelling, screaming. He was a great kid. I loved him to death. But I remember asking her, you know, after we got really, really cool. And she's like, that didn't change until the vaccines. And, you know, she has two kids. They were, they were twins. One of them is like severely autistic. The other one is like has Asperger's, but apparently Asperger's isn't a thing anymore. So I don't even know what that's about. And I'm kind of ranting at this point, but I think like, again, I wish I could do more research on this, but the ability for Google and chat GPT to give you any sort of information that isn't completely like, Oh, we have to protect the corporations. We're not allowed to look into this. What, what am I supposed to do? You know what I mean? And so my, my thing is, is if you're very like, you know, pro vaccine, that's fine. I don't necessarily have a problem with vaccines. Like it's more so of like, I have RFK junior stance of like, they should be safe. And big pharma has a really wide history of not making safe things. Um, and so uh, I would really look into that. I would really listen to his podcast. It's like three hours long, and it, but it's in like the first hour they talk about this. And so, again, the reason I find this interesting is given, you know, what 2020 was and 2021 and what's going on with serums. Like Neptune rules things like serums, right? Like antidotes. And when I look at Saturn, Neptune, and Aries, it's like, okay, some sort of serum related to like, energy or action or like it reminds me of like how nazis used to give like their soldiers like meth <laughs> um i wouldn't necessarily qualify nep- meth under the neptune thing um uh, maybe but i just wonder what can happen here and again the reason i'm even doing this video is like let's just look at what's been kind of going on here what were the major events and I, again in the comments let me know what your guys' thoughts are on like oh what this could look like or if you know something because so many of you know so much more about maybe what's going on or in your different whoops niche communities that I'm not that I'm not aware of. So let me know in the comments what you might think this is. So now let's talk about the Saturn Neptune conjunction in Libra in 1953. This is where we start seeing some connections. Number one is uh, in politics, we have the Korean War armistice. Uh, so the Korean War never ended. It's at an armistice right now. And the Korean War, which began in 1950, so essentially when like Saturn was making its way towards Neptune, uh, when Saturn can join Neptune, it's a ceasefire agreement. And, and again, this isn't Libra. Like the, and again, I always think it's funny that they split off. I think it's the 53rd parallel or 57th parallel. I forgot what the DMZ zone is, but why I think this is interesting, especially as of right now, as, as I've been working, I've been working on this kind of like um, research for like maybe well over a year now. Yeah. Well over a year. And Recently, in the past couple of months, Kim Jong-un's been like, yeah, we're going to fucking war. And so I wonder, like, again, this is in Libra, right? And the opposite of Libra is Aries. And that's where this Saturn-Neptune conjunction is happening. So part of me goes like, damn, I wonder if North Korea is not bluffing in this case. And I've and I've watched a couple of things where it's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's Kim Jong-un. He's just saber rattling. And I've seen other things where it's like, yeah, but he's actually making some moves that would indicate that this is a little bit more serious. So part of me is like, damn, is Saturn, like, is there going to be a Korean war again? 
Um, I mean, it never technically ended, to be honest with you guys. Now, what that looks like, I don't know. That's where you could turn the conspiracy knob up to 11. It's like China's paying North Korea to do a war so they can be distracted so they can invade Taiwan. And I still go back, like, the whole war with Taiwan thing is I'm still so uncertain about. It's like, I've heard so much of as, as to, like, why it'll never happen. And I've heard so much as to, like, it's totally going to happen um, that are both very compelling arguments where I'm like, if it was going to happen, I definitely feel like I know the timeline. I'm just not a thousand percent sure if it will happen. It, it's just if it does happen, that changes the face of global politics for a long, long time. That changes the face of the economy for a long, long, long time. Um, the like, you know, if we go to war with Iran, which we probably will, and if we go to, um, you know, war with Russia or whatever, that will also be a big deal. But the China one is we're so economically tied to China um it's that will get really complicated really fast so the next thing that we get in 1953 is the cia overthrows the iranian prime minister and installs the shah so why this is really important is essentially um bp i wasn't i don't think it was bp i think it was something else but it was a Brit british petroleum company they wanted more oil from iran and so they threw a coup to get rid of the uh like i'm pretty sure this was like a democratically elected prime minister and they installed the Shah, the king. That event is what set the precedent for the Iranian revolution that installed the, um, the uh, I always forget if it's Shia or Sunni. Um, that's, I always forget which one it is. Long story short, the Iranian government that no one really likes today, that started because of this CIA coup. And why I think this is interesting is the Israel-Palestine thing, what people don't understand is they're only looking at it at the surface of that. It's not about that. It's about Iran. I, just, I saw someone comment, like, it's not Iran, it's Iran. And it's like, okay, well, we Americans, we don't bully, like, Mexican people. We're saying Walmart or at and Just, like, it's fine. Like, let me say whatever the fuck I'm going to say. Like, I hate when people get so pissed off about white people not pronouncing things correctly when, like, every foreigner that has ever lived in America that doesn't have an American accent also doesn't pronounce things correctly. And we're not like, it's called Walmart. And they're saying Walmart. Uh, Jummer, like it's like I don't care. So when people get pissed off about that, it's like shut up. Um, I understand it's Iran or Iraq, but like shut up. It's Iran and Iraq. I'm gonna say it however I want to say it. But anyway, um, so we have this coup that happened, and what's interesting is this happened in July. This happened in August. Where is it at? In August, we see uh, these two events really happen on the Saturn Neptune conjunction. And again, the reason I think this is important is because you know. As we're, you know, as we are facilitating Israel's bombing of Palestine and Hamas, we are now attacking Houthi rebels. You know, it's about five more minutes till Hezbollah gets, you know, it enters the chat. And then there's there's like two or three other Iranian backed like militias that essentially if we start really going to war with them, which we really are already, at some point we will see Iran get involved. Now, Iran is kind of a complicated story because it's like. Will Russia chip in? Will China chip in? No one really knows. Iran just has a ton of missiles. That's all they do is make missiles. And there's also something about Saturn-Neptune conjunctions we'll talk about here. Or, oh, I don't, shit, I don't know if it's actually in here. No, that was in the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. Um, in my Jupiter-Uranus conjunction video, I talk about um, there was a bug. There was a, a hack that went into uh, Iranian uh, missile factories. And it was like this, this bug that like slowly ate away at the, like the facilities that like made these. Um, so like Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, Neptune, we're seeing like some Iran stuff kind of, you know, happen. Um, and again, I'm just, I look at this and I wonder what's going to happen in Iran. Like, are we going to throw a coup? Are we going to go to war? This is not necessarily, like, again, I'm more like, whoa, Korea comes up really loud, and especially what's going on right now, I feel a little bit more lenient towards Korea. Not not politically, but more so of, like, that being a thing with Iran. I also feel like that's a thing, but we only have so many examples of Saturn-Neptune conjunctions happening. So maybe it is a reach. Maybe I'm stretching here, but, you know, these are just things I would say pay attention to. And here's the good one. CIA op uh conducts mk ultra studies if you're not familiar with what mk ultra was and this was what 50 70 years ago that the cia was giving lsd to unknowing people unbeknownst to them even their own operatives and what they were trying to do look 
Uh, pretty much the CIA was giving people LSD to force mind control over people, mostly to get spies to confess truth. This is so Saturn, Neptune, and Libra, it's mind boggling. Like Neptune is these serums, Saturn is like this control and it's in Libra. I wanna manipulate the relationship between me and someone else. How would I do that through a serum that's going to tell you the truth? Quote unquote, truth. Um. This, the CIA was doing some fun stuff in the 50s, I'll tell you. They were very busy people, um, you know, throwing coups and, you know, mind control stuff. Now, what's interesting about this was, I believe it was 1971, maybe it was 73, but I, if, I'm, if I'm correct, it was during the Saturn-Neptune opposition when there was like some random Democrat, like from New Jersey, I think, that was like, I want to investigate the CIA, because what the fuck are they up to? And so they investigated them. The CIA threw like, all of the papers about MK Ultra away. Like they threw all of them away, but they were like stuffed in like some tax file box that like someone forgot about. And that's how they discovered MK Ultra was like literally by accident. So what MK Ultra really was, we don't have the papers for. The CIA threw that away. Isn't that don't you love that when your government that you pay for with your tax dollars uh is committing atrocities and they just cover it all up and no one goes to jail? It's mind-boggling. But I thought this was the most Saturn, Neptune, and Libra thing that we've had. And it, I think it's a really good example of Saturn, Neptune, and Aries, where I think of a lot of Saturn, ne Saturn Neptune, and Aries is also like, again, like robots. Um, like rather than US soldiers going to war, they're operating a drone, but like a human robot that goes into drone. Like part of me wonders if, like, okay, if this was like to manipulate relations, like, I don't know. Your brain can kind of, the imagination is very unlimited here when it comes to what this could be. But man, I thought this was interesting in terms of like Neptune literally being like serums and potions and Saturn's like governments and control and those things come together in Libra to like manipulate relationships through the CIA. I thought that was wild. So as we go through uh, 1953 politics again, Stalin dies. So all right, 1989, USSR falls, 1953, Stalin dies, and if you're not familiar with Russian politics, that was a big deal. Stalin was around for a minute. Um, also, when you get into history about Stalin, he is a very interesting character. He is so rational about a lot of things and so completely irrational about like these other things. Um, like he, I was talking to Hugh Tran about this, and I didn't know Stalin convinced Mao Zedong not to get rid of the Chinese language. He was like, that's retarded. Don't do that. And it's like during the Cultural Revolution and all that stuff. Um, so Stalin dies. What's also interesting here is Putin is born. Now, I don't remember if it's 1953 or 1954, but Putin has a Saturn-Neptune conjunction in his chart in Libra. So he was born around this time. And this, to me, it's like um, there's a popular meme right now where it's like someone dies and on, on that year, someone, some bigger celebrity today is born. It's like, welcome back, this person. So part of me is like, uh, Stalin dies 1953, Putin's born 1953 or four. Welcome back, <laughs> Stalin. <laughs> um, and so why I think this is important is the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in Aries is in Putin's sixth house of ill health. And he has all this stuff in his 12th house. And part of me is like, I almost would put money on Putin dying between early as 25, but definitely 26, 27. He's dying. Now, that's also a whole other thing is the people that replace him are very like neocons. They kind of want war. People get really um, butthurt when I say this, but like, Putin is a much more like rational person than like what the US media will lead you to believe. Um, am I saying he's a good person? No. However, um, everyone's like, Putin is this mad, crazy man. It's like, not really. Um, like, does he mess things up? Yeah. Is he a bad person? I would argue that. Um, but the people that replace him seem more hostile than he does. And I also said, you know, like, you know, Putin doesn't want to take over, you know, the the old USSR, the old Soviet Union. People are like, yes, he does. He wants to create. It's like, no, he doesn't. He literally makes a speech about this all the time. He, that's not what he's interested in. He's interested in not being bombed to death by NATO. We also have this. Uh, this happened in 1954. We had a Guatemala coup. So we have the invasion of Panama and we have a, Gua a, a coup in Guatemala. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this uh, the whole Iran and Guatemala um, and Nicaragua, this goes back to uh, Iran-Contra. Um, as well, like Iran Contra was essentially like the CIA was funding its coup, its rebels in Nicaragua, its right wing rebels in Nicaragua through selling uh, guns to Iran. I forgot how that all went down, but it was really, really bad. 
So anyway, we see kind of this invasion of Panama. We see this Guatemala coup that's kind of going on. So we see some South America stuff happening involving the American government. Where this goes is if Venezuela, I don't know if you guys have heard about this. This is really recent, but Venezuela is talking about invading Guyana, which is very like, okay, that's a weird priority to have. I don't, I don't think Guyana is any sort of American ally. However, there's a bunch of oil involved, of course. Um, and so whether or not we assist them, there's also a big thing going on in Ecuador right now. I don't really know. Like South American politics are very just like every five minutes there's some sort of left-wing uprising. But I wonder just what's going on in Central and South America. Again, one of my bigger predictions for the beginning of the U.S. divorce um, is the cartels in the in the Mexico border. Um, right now, what we're seeing is there's a debate between Texas and the federal government over like Texas is now enforcing the border and the federal government is now taking over that saying, Texas, you're not allowed to do that. And we have uh, here in 2024, we have a solar eclipse literally right over the border in Texas. And we have um, this Mars Saturn conjunction and this eclipse is in Aries. I wonder how much of like when we talk about central and South America, um, you know, Guatemala is central. Panama is technically central. I just wonder if this, again, like one of my bingo cards with World War III and the, the U.S. divorce is like, what's going on with the cartel things? Because like, and when I say cartels, that really just means the open borders and everyone flowing in. Um, I have a lot of theories as to why they would do that, but that that narrative seems to be ramping up. Um, and I just wouldn't be surprised if at like the same time we get involved here and there, or again, the discussions about the border are one of the main driving factors over why Texas might secede, for example. So I'm really interested in uh, American involvement in um, South America. Um, Truman announces the hydrogen bomb. I thought this was a little bit interesting. Not so much connected to um, the Libra stuff, but I do find this both scientific um, hydrogen is a little bit different than atom bombs, but that kind of goes into, um, well, not our, ne not our next thing. This is the next thing, but after this, uh, we also have the CIA Robertson's panel on UFOs, uh, around the early 1950s, there was a bunch of UFOs flying around, um, Washington DC and everyone was really concerned and I couldn't figure this out or not, but I'm almost positive. This was like one of the first federal government, like meetings about UFOs and what's going on. Um, yeah, there was the whole, uh, Roswell incident, but I, pretty sure this is one of the th things that people are like oh like what what is actually going on and isn't it interesting that ufos didn't really come about until like after we nuked japan essentially now this is another thing that's happened in 1954 but china constitute china constitution oh china and uh signs its constitution making it officially a communist state now i didn't know this um i was wondering what was going on in china and i looked a little bit more into it and like china had its political revolution it was like china's history is so funny it's so bad um meaning like it's just one bad thing after another with china so they have occupation of japan through like the 20s and 30s and then um world war ii kicks off you know they get japan out of there then they have a civil war which starts the whole like um taiwan thing like you know they were the nationals versus the communists the nationals got pushed out to taiwan um but in 1954 so not the exact saturn neptune conjunction but close to it china actually invokes its constitution making it officially a communist state now, again, this isn't like, oh, this is going to repeat again. But I was like, OK, that's an interesting point that I would think about. Um, and again, with a lot of these, I, I, the reason I like going over the history of this is like, here's some of the other things that happened. Now, will some of these things repeat exactly? Maybe not. But what will repeat? And this is kind of like what's on the menu for what might be repeatable now? Is China going to make a new constitution going back to communism? I don't know. But I wonder what government shifts happen in China. Um, 1989 was not um, the whole opening up to the West thing, but I think it was very close to that. So now we get to media. So this is what is really interesting. Lucille Ball gives birth on TV. Now, this was a big deal. Um, this was kind of like the first like <laughs> live birth on television thing with Saturn, like uh, – with Saturn, Neptune, and Libra, that, that's an interesting moment. And why I thought that was interesting is like Lucille, Lucille Ball has some things going on with Saturn, Neptune conjunctions. And I haven't looked much more at her chart. I was just like, that's weird that like there was a big moment in media related to Lucille Ball on a Saturn, Neptune conjunction. And then she died in 1989 on a Saturn, Neptune conjunction. Also, this one uh, was interesting to me. 
Christine Jorgensen sex reassignment surgery, and she died in 1989. Now, I had no idea who this was, so I had to look this up, but Christine Jorgensen was kind of like, wasn't the first trans person, but like the first trans person in the U.S. public's eye. Like, essentially, this American person went to, I think it was like Switzerland or Sweden, got a sex reassignment surgery, came back to America, it was all over the newspaper and all over the TV. This was like America's first introduction into like transsexuals. And I don't think that's the appropriate term, but that's what they used to call it back then. I don't even know. Like, I don't, I still never understand that. Like, what's the difference between transsexuals and transgenders? Isn't that the same thing? I don't know. Um, but why I thought that was interesting is like very Saturn, Neptune, and Libra. Like, again, distortion um, if like reality with certain things. And, you know, if you want to sit here and argue like, oh, trans people are real, that's not what this is about. But the idea of kind of like where there was a binary that slowly began to be distorted around this time. Um, at least where people were kind of like, what What does that fucking mean? I can't imagine being in the 1950s and being introduced to the concept of transgender. It's hard for people to compute or like comprehend today. Imagine 1953 people being like, what the fuck does that mean? Um, but why I think this is interesting is not only this is a big media story, but again, what we're seeing right now is this whole trans movement and trans backlash. And while that was in Libra, this one's in the opposite in Aries and like, I don't necessarily have full predictions on it yet. The other thing was, um, I looked a little bit more into this. Kim Petras, who I had no idea was trans. Like, I'd heard her name before. I was like, oh, this person's trans. She was, like, one of the first kids to get transitioned, which she went on TV in 2006 during the Saturn-Neptune opposition in uh, Leo and Aquarius talking about like, I'm trans and I wanna get sex reassignment surgery. And I forgot what the story was, but it was like somehow she was able to do it, I think at like 16 and she's like been trans ever since. So that to me was kind of like, oh, 2006, another celebrity, another person comes up in the media around transgender issues that was a little bit more like 2006 was like, I mean, now nowadays like everyone's trans and their kids, but 2006, that was, pretty early like that was definitely still a newer concept um and so you know part of me looks at the saturn neptune conjunction of like it wouldn't i mean you can kind of look at the political landscape nowadays and like something's going to happen with you know the trans stuff because there's like there's big push for it and now there's this big push back for it pendulum swinging both ways what this looks like i don't know part of me wonders if like saturn neptune and libra was like you know the a, a very public you know sex reassignment surgery um, I wonder if Saturn, Neptune, and Aries, the opposite is like a detransitioner. I don't know. That's kind of like what I'm thinking, but my interpretation of all of this is very open to change. I'm just right now, again, laying, laying out for you guys what was going on and what I think was pretty interesting. Uh, 1953, Georgia approves liter uh, liter literature censorship board. So again, we're censoring media, Saturn, Neptune stuff. We also have Short Creek Raid of Mormon Polygamists. Um, this is what I thought was really interesting because this was essentially like the government trying to attack polygamy. Um, and you know what's really crazy is like over the past couple of days, I've seen a bunch of articles being like, is your relationship ready for, you know, polyamory? Or I for, polyamory is, I think both sexes can have whatever they want versus like polygamy is like, um, there are, there is like a, you know, it's just for like guys can have multiple wives, but there was some sort of attack on this. Like they wanted to like demonize this, but here are the two major media things I was really looking at. Playboys first published in 1953. When you want to talk about media and the media landscape changing, like, I don't know if the Saturn Neptune can, like if this was the first actual indication of porn. Like I know like back in like, again, World War One and like even World War Two, like guys had nudes of their wives and stuff like that. Like they'd send them off or like really, you know, um, seductive photos. But I kind of look at the Saturn Neptune of like, again, media around relationships or even around women. Now that's kind of a whole different other story too. But this kind of idea of media in, in Playboy and like, again, I don't have to explain what Playboy is, but part of me wonders what goes on in maybe even like with Aries, the opposite of that. What kind of happens maybe in the porn industry? Um, what happens, again, th this is just an excellent example of like some sort of new media began. And like Playboy is a very, very, very big deal. And I mean, we're still seeing the effects of that today. And then of course, Fahrenheit 451 is published. Um, I thought this was a very 
big book. Um, most people would agree with that. Now, the only thing is to say here is like, again, it doesn't take a Saturn-Neptune conjunction to create a big storyline or anything like that, but we do see these major um, books or these major pieces of media coming out during Saturn-Neptune conjunctions. So coming back to media, uh, color television. This is the big one, I thought. So again, uh, Saturn-Neptune opposition in uh, 2006, iPhone, 1989 conjunction, Game Boy. Um, 1971 was email, 1953, we have color television. So the first color television sets became available to the public and CBS made history by broadcasting the first coast to coast color television program, a production of Carmen. Also videotape recording, Ampex introduced the first practical and commercially successful videotape recording system in 1953. The technology revolutionized television production by enabling the recording and subsequent playback of broadcasts. And the first 3D film, the first 3D feature film, House of Wax, starring Vincent Price, was released in 1953. Those were bangers. Like, yo, color television, videotape recording, first 3D film. Very big advancements in media, in my opinion. Um, so again, where I'm like 100% on in terms of Saturn Neptune is like some big change in media or media technology. Again, this is why my finger's on the pulse with Apple Vision Pro. Again, I don't think it's going to be big this year or even 2025, but 2026. And again, I'm going to go over my predictions here in a minute, but it's like 2026 and the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in Aries is the augmented singularity event. Um, essentially, augmented reality singularity event where it's not necessarily virtual reality that's going to be big. It's augmented reality where essentially, again, like your whole house is kind of a screen and glass. Like there's kind of just screens everywhere, but you could still see what's going on in reality. You're not completely immersed in the metaverse the metaverse is mixed in with reality. Mixed reality is a good way to put it. And so then we get uh, 1953 for science and chemicals. In 1953, one notable chemical breakthrough was the discovery of the structure of DNA by James Watson and Francis Crick. This groundbreaking finding laid the foundation for advancements in molecular biology and, hard and had far-reaching implications of genetics and biotechnology. Um, what does it have to do with Saturn-Neptune? Um, again, Saturn-Neptune is very science, and there's actually a really good reason that we're going to talk about here really soon. But I thought what was interesting about this being in Libra is like the double helix of like these two things spiraling together, which I mean, it's either Gemini or Libra, in my opinion, of like the DNA structure. Um, it's also like two things coming together. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm reaching here. Maybe I'm reaching. Like, I have no problem with people being like, all right, Cam, like maybe this is that's a little bit of a reach. But again, I'm just pointing out interesting things that have happened. So let's talk about 1917 Saturn Neptune conjunction in Leo. So 1917, we have the Balfour Declaration, which is the beginnings of the creation of the state of Israel. I had never heard of this before until I looked into this. Well, until I was looking up Saturn-Neptune stuff. Essentially, the Balfour Declaration was like someone in the UK was like, Israel should totally be a state. Um, and <sighs> this is going to rustle some feathers. There is some really interesting connections as to how Israel became a state during the Holocaust, um, again, the Holocaust and, you know, Israel and Jews, it's one of those things that you're just not allowed to talk about. And for me, I don't have emotional investment on either side. But the more that I understand how Israel was formed and how it kind of had its beginnings here and how that actually involved the Holocaust and things is I don't know enough about it, but I can say enough to say that's interesting and that the whole truth of that situation is not necessarily mainstream. And it's also one of the things where um, the, and I said this, I think of the Jupiter Uranus conjunction video or the 2024 video, I forgot which one. The whole Palestine Israel thing is like, that shit happens every five minutes that like, there's no like one set um, uh, uh, formation or one set event that happens, um, like or one transit that happens about Israel Palestine. It seems like it's every five minutes with them. But in 2006, I think that was when Hamas was elected. I would be curious, and I couldn't find anything about this. But if I have any people that are more academics in this area related to 1953 in Israel, like what was going on in 1953 in Israel? Maybe what was going on in 1989 with Israel? Um, because I'd be curious about that happening like is like 1953 when like their constitution was written or or something along those lines but that was interesting to me 
Uh, America enters World War I. This will be very important context for other episodes. Now, the thing is with this is America was kind of attacked in order to get into World War I, but not really. Um, and what we see with America Wars, and again, I'm going to talk about this in, my, in one of my next videos, is Mars, Uranus, Conjunctions, and Gemini. It's like U.S. Revolution, Mars, Uranus, Conjunction, Gemini. Day of Civil War started, Mars, Uranus, Conjunction, Gemini. Uh, invasion of Italy and the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, Mars, Uranus, Conjunction, Gemini. We get our next one of those in July of 26. So big, like, war advancements with the U.S. military happens. And so the reason I kind of bring this up is, number one, we get involved in a world war not necessarily because we were attacked. Like, again, I think it was like the Lithuania or what. Something happened where we got, like, attacked, but it was kind of like we were probably going to go in anyway. Um because again, this was like Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was like a fucking horrible um, president. There's a whole like again, history is not as simple as like this is what happened and this is what not happened. This is what didn't happen. It's like there's so many moving pieces. History is not as simple as so many people want it to be. And I think it's really important to like when you learn about history, um, to have that mindset. Like if you only believe one narrative about history, about any event in history, that it's oh, this is just what happened and it was bad so the good guy stopped it. It's like, there was a lot more forces at play. History is very complicated when you hear each side of the story and you put all the pieces together yourself. That includes World War I. So America enters World War I. That's going to be an important context for other episodes. And again, Russia, Russia Revolution. I have to put the parentheses, communism. This was the communist revolution, the Bolsheviks versus the proletariat, um, the bourgeois um, so again, 1989, USSR falls. 1953, Stalin dies, which is, a, again, a very pivotal point for um, Russia. And then we have the third Saturn-Neptune conjunction, which is communism, the Russian Revolution, which kind of started this whole you know situation. So that, to me, is like, all right, we have three hot markers of big, end of big events happening in Russia. And then also we have the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Now, if you want to get to the very roots of why the Middle East is where it's at today— it is this. Essentially, um, after we after like the UK and America like conquered the Ottoman Empire during World War I, the British, the French, and the US looked at a map of the Middle East and they said, and this is something Stalin did, um, how can we make these borders so bad that there has to be instability? Kurds don't get a nation. The whole Kurdish people not getting a nation is a whole other thing. Um like Iraq and like Iraq's got like four or five like different big populations that aren't necessarily the same thing. Same thing with Iran. Same thing with um, like uh, what was it? I think Syria too. Um, you know, then there's things like Azerbaijan and Armenia and all that kind of good stuff. The Sykes Picot Agreement was essentially like the French and the in the UK and the US being like, how can we fuck this region up so bad? that there has to be war and conquering here. Um, when you read about this, it's really interesting, but essentially all of those borders over there make zero sense. They're designed that way for a reason. Why they've kept them, well, I shouldn't say why they've kept them that same way, I don't know, because it involves war, it involves all other issues. Um, but the Sykes-Picot Agreement in terms of like chopping up the Middle East, um, same thing when we get to 1953, this is when like we did the Iranian coup, we see some kind of like interesting events uh, in the Middle East. Now this one is again, I'm at like a, 75% of, that's interesting. I wonder how much of a connection we have there. But again, you, you know, we already had, we went to war with Afghanistan and Iraq and Kuwait. And, you know, the whole Middle East situation is so very complex um, to where it's like, I think it's very low hanging fruit to be like, yeah, we're totally going to go to, you know, war in the Middle East, um, specifically with Iran. But I look at this as like, it's interesting that, you know, the Sykes-Picot agreement was happening, th that just happened here. 1917 media. So there's only really two things here um, that I think were interesting, or at least one that was really interesting. So we have commercial radio broadcasting. So this says, while radio technology itself was not new, 1917 saw the United States formally enter World War I and the U.S. government took control of radio stations to ensure secure communication. After the war in the early 1920s, radio broadcasting transitioned to a commercial medium, transforming the way information and entertainment were dis disseminated. So we're not going to say this is the beginning of radio, but I thought this was interesting to bring up. But the other thing I think is more important is here. While the concept of colored movies or color cinematography was explored and experimented within the earliest 20th century, the first commercially successful color process to color technicolor 
was introduced in 1917. One of the earliest films to use the two-color Technicolor process was The Gulf Between, released in 1917. So we have pretty much colored movies coming out in 1917. And then it, I believe it was three-way Technicolor that made its way in 1953. Um, so again, we see like this kind of pivotal moment with media. Like Technicolor is a really big deal. Like I remember watching Looney Tunes and like back in the day, it would be like, you know, made with Technicolor, like that sort of a thing. So when it comes... We have a lot more to go, actually, to talk about. I, this is already an hour long. I didn't think this would take a whole hour to talk about. But some of the you know major predictions I just want to say is we have a big thing with Russia. Putin dies. World War III. Um, again, we had World War I with there. We have these um, invasions of places. And I have a whole, like, two other episodes I'm going to make about why World War III is happening. Disney Renaissance. That's happening. Again, the augmented reality singularity event. That's what I think the Saturn Neptune in conjunction in Aries is really going to be is this, you know, again, morphing our actions and our identity along with, you know, computer technology. And again, this is why my, I'm like Apple vision pro, I think maybe not this moment, but in about two years will be a much bigger deal. Again, a lot of people didn't think the iPhone was going to be a big deal. And if you want to know more, watch my video on the Apple vision pro that I did. Um, we'll have a turning point in China. We're going to have some new, t uh, chemical technology that I think will really kind of hit the service. Um, and we're going to come back to this again. This is just me fleshing out my ideas. But let's go a little bit more into the past really fast. I want to get through this real quick because I actually didn't think this was going to take this long. And I actually have things to do. Um, Saturn conjoins Neptune and Taurus. Now, this one involved Pluto. This is also when we had a um, – there was some pandemic that happened around here. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but we have the Triple Alliance. The Triple Alliance was formed between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, solidifying a defensive alliance in Central Europe. So this actually came up during the First World War which was, again, the Axis powers against pretty much everything else. We have the Chinese Exclusion Act in the United States, which also was really interesting. Here, where I live in Denver, I live in Lodo, and right down the street from me, if you, um, if you go to Urban Farmer or um, the, the Oxford Hotel, right across the street, there's a little plaque that says, like, pretty much the beginning of, like, the Chinese Exclusion Act happened here, where it was, like, pretty much a big bar fight broke out, and that this area of town used to be like Chinatown, but they kicked out all the Chinese. And this was a big time of like, everyone hated the Chinese back at this time. But the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act was signed into law in the United States, restricting immigration of Chinese laborers for 10 years. That is interesting to me. Um, only because again, just kind of coming back to the whole geopolitical system right now with, with China. Then we get the Egyptian Ottoman War. The British Empire intervened in Egypt during the Egyptian Ottoman War, leading to the occupation of Egypt. So again, we kind of have this like, now, this is also a different time for the British Empire um, in terms of, again, Middle Eastern stuff. Uh, for media, I have no idea what this is, but I know I have a couple of you nerds that know exactly what this is and maybe why it's a big deal. But when I was looking up stuff in media, Gilbert and Sullivan's, oh, I'm going to botch this one, Lolithan, Lolanth, Lolanth, or Lolanth. The comic opera Lolanth by Gilbert and Sullivan premiered in London, adding to their series of successful collaborations. When I put this in chat GP, ch chat GPT in terms of like what was going on in media around this time, they brought this up, so maybe it was a big deal. I don't know. Science and chemicals in 1882, uh, Robert Koch's tuberculosis discovery. German physician and microbiologist Robert Koch announced his discovery of the bacterium causing tuberculosis, a significant breakthrough in understanding of the disease. Interesting, right? Uh, now we have the Saturn conjunct uh, Neptune in Aquarius in 1846. This one's very interesting in terms of why I have reasons to believe about this whole Civil War divorce thing going on. If we talk about politics, in 1846, we had the Mexican-American War. The conflict between the United States and Mexico began in 1846. Okay. Interesting, right? We're already talking about that. Um, repeal of the Corn Laws in Britain. I don't like, I'm just going to write this. Maybe it's more important than I'm thinking. Um, the British Parliament repealed the Corn Laws in 1846. These laws had imposed tariffs on imported grain, and their re uh, repeal marked a shift towards free trade. That is interesting to me. And this is happening in Aquarius, too, right? Like this kind of idea of like exchange of goods and services. It's not, it's more so Capricorn, in my opinion, but just being able to be more free about trading is interesting. Now, this is another thing. I thought was really interesting was the Seneca Falls Convention held in July of 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York. This convention marked the beginning of the women's suffrage movement in the United States. The participants discussed women's rights and drafted the Declaration of Sentiments. Um, to be honest with you, this is going to be mind blowing. Some of you are going to be really shocked when I say this. 
I'm not an expert in the women's rights movement. I know, I know. I know that's shocking news. But <laughs> I wish, um, again, it's one of those things where I kind of think about the Joe Jorgensen thing or Christine Jorgensen thing, and I wonder when, because there's like four waves of feminism. I don't, I, I, I don't pay attention to it. Um, but I do think that this is kind of interesting that the whole women's suffrage movement began during the Saturn Neptune, and that was an Aquarius too, right? So like Aquarius is much more humanitarian, equal rights, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting in terms of giving us an idea of like, oh, here's again another really good example of an Aquarius transit of like, okay, like what about equality for women? How it involves Saturn Neptune, I don't know. Like, again, maybe it was because the idea of women having rights in a brain is like a far reaching concept back then. So it was like reality crushing. Or I don't know. Like, I don't know. Um, I don't know. So I would be really curious on your thoughts on this. And then my big one is Texas becomes a state. The fact that Texas became a state on a Saturn Neptune conjunction and everything that's going on between Texas and the federal government right now regarding immigration and how we're going to have an eclipse there. And like, I'm really, if there is going to be, I'm looking at two places in terms of the U.S. divorce. I'm going to talk about this in the other episode. It's, it's either Texas or Idaho. Those are the two places I'm looking at. If like, if there was going to be start starting to be state secessions, those are my two hot buttons. It's Idaho, Texas. And for you that don't know about Idaho, Idaho is so red, it makes Texas look like, like a literal communist state. Idaho is very, very, very red. They are pretty much ready to be their own country at this point. Um, and the same thing too, Eastern Oregon is trying to become a part of Idaho. There's really no like um, a consensus on how that works in the constitution, all this other stuff. So that's interesting. Um, in terms of science and chemicals in 1846, we have the discovery of Neptune, which was used by math to discover French mathematician Urbain Le Verrier and British mathematician John Couch Adams independently predicted the existence and location of Neptune. German astronomer Johann Gottfried Gall observed Neptune based on these predictions in September 1846. I love finding Neptune, this planet of like illusion and mysticism through like math because it was literally elusive and it's very like Aquarius. So Neptune's discovered, right? And then in 1846, the English chemist and physicist William Robert Grove developed the Grove cell. Uh, <laughs> so funny. An early form of a fuel cell. This invention laid the groundwork for the later development of fuel cell technology, which is applications in generating electricity through electrochemical reactions. So essentially a battery is what was happening here. It's pretty much invention of a battery. That's really interesting to me too. Um, and again, it's also using uh, electrochemical reactions. So it's like it, it, anything about a battery, it's like, I, again, this might surprise you guys, but I am not an electrical chemical engineer like master. But from what I understand about batteries, there's some liquid going on there. So again, Neptune stuff. <laughs> again, maybe I'm, maybe I'm reaching. I don't know. We're just having fun thinking about history. Saturn conjoins Neptune and Sagittarius in 1809. Not a lot of stuff going on here. Although... Um, this was the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in Sagittarius. This was when Lincoln was born. I don't know if that matters at all. But in 1809, 1809 French chemist Joseph Louis Gay Lussac formulated Gay Lussac's Law. <laughs> I love that scientists name things after themselves. Which described the relationship between the pressure and temperature of a gas at a constant volume. This law was a significant contribution to the understanding of gas behavior and played a crucial role in the development of thermodynamics. So again, Saturn-Neptune... Like we're literally talking about like the pressure and gases. Like Neptune, I've talked so much about is like literally gassy. It's like a fog machine. And we're understanding the pressure between things here. Um, 1809 was in Sagittarius. So Sagittarius, like again, how much the zodiac sign implies here. Like I can't connect the dots here in this moment. But I thought this was really interesting. So let's talk about the next big one, which is the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in Virgo. Oh, uh, wait, was it here? Okay, there was one in Aries that happened and that involved the Jupiter uh, conjunction. So I'm just trying to make sure I cover that. So 1773 to 1774, what was going on during then? I don't know. 1773 politics, the Boston Tea Party, which took place on December 16th. During this event, American colonists protesting against British taxation without representation dumped 342 chests of British tea into the Boston Harbor as a form of protest. This act of defiance played a significant role in the lead up to the American Revolutionary War. So we have the Boston, and again, the Saturn-Neptune conjunction kind of started like the whole like U.S. revolution, which is arguably too. I've heard this recently. the The U.S. revolution was the first civil war, and that the, the civil war we call today the civil war is actually the second civil war. 
We also get the East India Company Act, so the Tea Act. This is the British Parliament passed the Tea Act in 1773, granting the financially struggling East India Company a monopoly on tea sales in the American colonies. This act contributed to the tensions that led to the Boston Tea Party. Interesting, right? First partition of Poland. This I thought was really interesting in terms of like, you know, Poland can't ever catch a break. In Europe, the first partition of Poland occurred in 1773 involving the partitioning of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth territory among Russia, Prussia, and Austria. This is one of the events leading to the eventual uh, disintegration of Poland as a sovereign state. Um, again, this is something where I'm just like, I can't connect any other dots to it. Maybe like, again, the whole World War One thing and all of that, but this would be like, I would put a star next to this and just be like, I wonder what might happen here. But, you know, we'll see as time goes on. So we get to 1774. Now the Saturn-Neptune conjunction was in 1773, like late 73. But my other issue with this stuff too is like, things happen so fast nowadays versus like, you know, back then they had to like take a horse. It took like, you know, a month to get anywhere. So I feel like things were just slower back then in general in terms of like how fast, like, you know, things are really gonna be happening. So 1774, we also have the Intoler Intolerable Acts. In response to the Boston Tea Party, the British Parliament passed a series of punitive measures known as the Coercive Acts or Intolerable Acts in 1774. These laws were designed to assert British control over the American colonies and punish Massachusetts in particular. Okay. Um, so again, I, I there's things that like aren't inherently exactly the same with like what's going on in America, but like, boy, they're really close. Like Texas becoming a state is also really interesting too. Um then we also have the First Continental Congress. In response to the Intolerable Acts, delegates from the 12 American colonies gathered in Philadelphia in September of 1774 for the First Continental Congress. They discussed grievances, peti petitioned the British Crown, and called for the boycott of British goods. So again, I will bring this up also when we start talking about like the U.S. divorce eventually, but I found this really interesting to be happening on a Saturn-Neptune conjunction. Uh, also, we have the Quebec Act of 74, Passed by the British Parliament in 74, the Quebec Act expanded the boundaries of Quebec and granted religious freedom to Catholics in the region. It was seen unfavorably by American colonists who viewed it as a threat to their own political and religious freedoms. Don't know what that has to do with Saturn Neptune. It was just another thing that was an important highlight of 74. If you know more about it, let me know in the comments. Now, when it comes to science, in 1773, Joseph Priestley's discovery of oxygen in the field of science. English chemist and theologian Joseph Priestley discovered oxygen and described it as a, this is going to be a fucked up word, uh, defilogisticated air, defilogisticated air. This is a groundbreaking contribution to the understanding of chemistry. So I really like this too, because this was in Virgo of like, what is air? Like, again, just I, Virgo's an earth sign, but I think of Neptune as like, again, gassy, um, and I, I wish I knew what this word meant, defilogisticated, defilogisticated. Um, but anyway, another science breakthrough, discovering oxygen is a big deal. Now let's talk about the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in cancer. So when we talk about, I only got one thing in this, because when I started this research in 2022, for whatever reason, Google has gone to shit lately, and I can't find this. But I saw a really well-read article about like, chemical engineering beginning during this time. Like one of the first processes of any sort of chemical engineering began during the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in cancer. And it was something to do with like a salt. I can't remember what it was because I can't find it anymore. And so it, it drives me crazy that I can't find it. This was something else. But if you know what I'm talking about, like chemical engineering in the beginning of like 1738 and how that kind of like started things. Again, this was also during the industrial revolution. Um, 1738, um, boy, it was really hard not to make a uh, wet Fetty Wap joke here. But in 1738, the English chemist Josh Joshua Ward is credited with establish establishing a sulfuric acid production facility using the chamber process. While this development wasn't as advanced as the later lead chamber process, it contributed to the early commercial production of sulfuric acid. The chamber process involved the use of an earthenware or glass vessels for the production of sulfuric acid and laid the groundwork for later advancements and large-scale production methods. Essentially, sulfuric acid is in like everything. It's a really big deal. And this kind of like kickstarted like more uses of it. But I swear to God, there was something to do with like chemical engineering around this time and I can't find it. But Saturn Neptune conjunction in Aries, this one involved Jupiter. This is 1702 to 1704. A few things with politics. Um, we have the War of Spanish Secession, the war which began in 1701, continued into 1702. It was a major conflict involving European powers over who would inherit the Spanish throne. 
the hard part about going into like this far back with politics is everything that like looks so different. Um, there's only one thing here that I think is really important to bring up. Uh, the next thing is Queen Anne's War. This conflict, part of the War of Spanish Secession, took place in North America between the English and French colonial forces. Again, so a Saturn-Neptune conjunction before the uh, the revolution. We had another war here in America over Europe's problems. But this is what was interesting to me. Coming back to Russia, founding of St. Petersburg. Tsar Peter the Great of Russia founded the city of St. Petersburg, a strategic move to establish a new capital and facilitate access to the Baltic Sea. So again, Russia keeps having these things happen in Saturn-Neptune. I don't know what the deal is with that, but it seems like almost every time. Uh, now, with media in 1702, 1704, we have the publishing of the Daily Courant. So in 1702, the Daily Courant became the first daily English language newspaper to be published. Interesting. That was 1702, okay? So I put, uh, this is the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in Aries. This correlated with a Saturn-Jupiter conjunction in Aries. This is 1702 to 1704. Establishment of the Boston Newsletter. In 1704, John Campbell published the first continuously published newspaper in North America, the Boston Newsletter. While not in 1703, this early newspaper played a role in shaping colonial communication. Now, what's interesting is we are going into a Saturn-Neptune conjun conjunction in Aries, and this one happened in Aries. But again, this happened over 300 years ago, 330 years ago. And trying to connect the dots with those two things, especially in terms of like media, is like, genuinely challenging and all i can do is be like hey this is what i found if you know more please let me know below um but it's it is i i found it to be a struggle connecting all of these dots of like okay well if we had a saturn neptune conjunction aries like what happened before versus like i'm sorry we live in a we live in an alien universe compared to 1704 but this is the one i wanted to talk about this to me was mind-blowing when i was doing a little bit more research because i went through like every saturn neptune conjunction for a long time and then again once you get like past the 1700s and like the 16 and 1500s it, it's just there's like so little there now get this 1594 romeo and juliet is a tragedy written a tragedy play written by william shakespeare it is believed to have been written between 1591 and 1595 and it was the first and it was first published in 1597 in quattro edition now if we take a look at um what do I want to do here? I want to do this. Sorry. I want to do this. And then let's bring up the chart. If we look here, this is 1594, as you could see in this top right, in this uh, top left corner. We have the Saturn Neptune conjunction in Leo. Now, if I was a betting man, like again, it says it was written between 1591. So this was like Saturn and Cancer and 1595. Saturn and Virgo. I would bet that it was really written in 1594, um, given Saturn, Neptune, and Leo. Uh, I thought that the idea that Romeo and Juliet, I mean, one of the biggest stories ever told, like almost 500 years ago, was written during a Saturn, Neptune conjunction. That to me is like where I'm 100% on is media, storytelling, Saturn, Neptune all day long. Um, everything else, I think chemicals and like science is going to be kind of a bigger deal too, but the media thing was really striking. So that's what I have for you guys today. I'm going to do more videos on the Saturn Neptune conjunction, but this was like, I just wanted to introduce it and get it out there. Cause there's a lot that we're going to talk about both with, you know, Uranus and Gemini and Pluto and just Neptune and Aries in general. But I just wanted to go over the Saturn Neptune as kind of a foreground in terms of like, I don't see many astrologers talking about it. I think it's a bigger deal than what we're looking at, especially when you connect it with Neptune, just ingressing into Aries. Uranus going into Gemini, Pluto going into Aquarius. So let me know what your thoughts are below in the comments, and I'll be seeing you guys next time.